screen and slides. So it's very nice to meet you all. And thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, so um, I guess I'm the bit after Trish. So if, if we if we don't manage to successfully prevent infection, particularly in community settings, how can we best manage um, COVID in, I guess, the ultimate healthcare environment, which is people's own homes? Um, and um, what we found um, in, in England is not dissimilar to what was seen all around the world in patients presenting quite late sometimes with quite severe COVID because um, it doesn't present with classical symptoms of um, breathlessness as many respiratory illnesses do, for instance. And it woke us up to thinking about rewriting our textbooks to look at um, more general symptoms and signs that a patient might not be well, but not purely focused around this concept of breathlessness. So whilst breathlessness is predictive, it's not always present. And as this, this horrendous case demonstrates, and this was replicated all around England and indeed around the world, um, it, we needed to be vigilant with other signs. So the, the concept of silent hypoxia, of presenting with very low oxygen levels, with an absence of breathlessness, was coined quite early on in the pandemic. And it made us realise that this battle was not going to be won by ventilators and hospitals and by all the technology that um, we could throw at this illness, but was going to be managed through best case management at home, educating the general public in ensuring that they were escalated and they had the ability to monitor themselves where appropriate to seek help at the earliest opportunity should they start to deteriorate. So all this was around how we protect patients in the course of their illness, but also how we protect the healthcare system because the healthcare system has got to be there for people that significantly deteriorate. And unfortunately, we lack the resources to have a healthcare system that deals with milder illness sometimes, particularly in the course of a pandemic. Um, so we began um, last year and, and Trish and colleagues wrote this really good article on very sensible advice on how best we should do remote assessments um, with COVID. And it was really important work for us because we quickly realised that we would not be able to see patients with um, early symptoms of COVID, both because of scale, but also for the practicalities of an infectious disease process. So this very common sense guidance, which I urge you to read, really looked at how you could best do um, take histories, what significant symptoms might be and how you might begin to do examination over the phone or if, if you're lucky enough to have an internet connection over telemedicine and um, FaceTime. And then a decision and action tool thereafter. And it really rose the question of, well, oxygen saturations, we agree, is a really important element of assessment. What if we could do this everywhere? And if we did this everywhere, could we start to prevent some of the avoidable deaths we potentially saw during first peak? And it really rose the question about what we needed, which was hopefully to come in the next few weeks, a validated scoring system for assessing patients in the community and in the interfaces of care to determine who is at highest risk and might need urgent hospital attention. And um, really early on in the pandemic, certainly in this country, we began pulling together the arrangements to track patients and their processes all the way from home to the ambulance service, and to the hospital and then all the departments in the hospital to figure out what the early signs of deterioration were in the community at patients own homes. And what we found after um, quite in-depth study was that oxygen saturations are probably the best predictor of whether a patient is likely to die, end up requiring ventilation or end up requiring an admission. And um, what we found was that 92% or below appeared to be the magic number in terms of prediction of five-day mortality, 30-day mortality, and indeed intensive care mortality and admission as well. So that, that cutoff of 92% or below appeared significantly different from 93% or above. And it felt like a good line in the sand as a result. Um, and that's why we based our national guidance around those very simple, clear metrics. 92% or below, go and seek help. 93 to 94 being an amber type group where you need to watch carefully. 95 to 100 generally in the absence of severe symptoms is a patient who is at the, that present time okay. 
And um, the other important thing from that research was demonstrating that actually a lot of the admissions and people attending hospital had normal oxygen levels in the 95 to 100% range and were therefore milder risk. And this was really important. Rather than admitting everyone, but turning off the tap of admissions to ensure we had flow through the emergency care sector. And this is a graph demonstrating that composite outcome of mortality and in intensive care admission and showing that steep climb at 92% and below. What this led to was the purchase of large numbers of computers, around 700,000 dogs yeah. across the country, and then eventually a national mandate to get home oxygen monitoring done across the country. There has been chatter about whether um, there is uh, inaccuracies with pulse oximetry and darker skin. And the overall take home message is the benefits significantly outweigh the risks by some margin. And although we need to do further research into this, because at the moment the research is not of high quality, in England, certainly, we have not seen any incidents where there have been inaccuracies in the course of clinical care. And that's after distributing half a million oximeters. And the advice really is record that baseline oxygen saturation where possible, compare subsequent readings against that baseline, and never forget clinical judgment and the trends of both symptoms and saturation readings for patients over time. So the overview for this strategy is around how we protect patients and how do we protect healthcare systems because there's limited capacity for both from a patient perspective it's cluing them up into what the bad signs are what the good signs are and when and how they should conduct themselves in the home environment to prevent spread to others and their nearly or, or loved ones and then from protecting the healthcare system it's really important we get the flow right to ensure that admissions come in appropriately, discharges go early and in, in a period of stability, and that we don't overcrowd or overwhelm the healthcare system. And the model itself of, of remote home monitoring is based around a very flexible model based on the resources available, be it in a village or an urban center, a very poor area or a very rich area. And this is the spread in every single country around the world. It, you know, there is, there is, there are places in every part of the world where we don't have oximeters, where we don't have teleconsultations or video chats, where actually good advice about what symptoms to look out for are really important and safety netting advice for when people should seek help and what they should be worried about. Um, and that should be a pattern in everywhere. And as we get more tech savvy and as we get more income and resource, we spread towards oximetry monitoring, potentially with diaries and instructions to patients, videos and YouTubes on how to spot the bad signs within COVID and how to monitor yourself and track yourself. And then in the ultra high resourced areas, the use of apps or dashboards together with teleconsultations. But it's not a one size fits all. There is a variable model based on the resource that's available. And that's really important going forward. And it, and it was across the world. Not everyone has access to a smartphone that is linked to telemedicine or consultation. Um, you know, we, we need the basics as well. And actually the basics are probably the most important elements. There has been a lot of talk about what treatments help with COVID, and um, we did quite a lot of study into the use of budesonide inhalers. And unfortunately, at the moment, the readout does not suggest it improves hospitalization or deaths. Um, further studies are obviously underway, and we hope it will, you know, some will prove some favorable evidence. But the, 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 the current statement is that it's not for wide scale prescriptions because um, it hasn't demonstrated improvement, at least in England. Um, it did purport to a, a slightly improved recovery time, but it was difficult to separate that from a potential placebo effect. So, this is important, an important part of, I guess, pandemic preparation is also using resources appropriately and uh, not going down rabbit holes. And we need to be very careful with the finances and resources we have to invest in the things that actually have evidence behind them and that work. So back to the concept of virtual care or care for patients with COVID at home. Now this green group is 90% of patients with COVID in a really important area. Instruction, information and trust between clinician and healthcare system and the patient is really important. We need to inform people what normal looks like. You know, why, when should you get worried, but also when you should not get worried, when not to contact the healthcare system, because you realize this is the normal course of illness. 
we have to realize early on who the high risk categories of patients are and who are the much lower risks and to reassure patients that normal recovery takes two to four weeks. You're not going to feel amazing until you get through that period. And maybe don't contact your healthcare provider unless you trigger atypical symptoms beyond these. We know what the more benign symptoms are with COVID. We know that having a cough or, or expectorating sputum or having a loss of sense of smell or taste, whilst potentially being predictive of having COVID, does not predict you're, that you are going to die or that you're going to require an hospital admission. And again, this is really important to reinforce to patients. Look out for these symptoms, they're usual symptoms, but don't worry about them unless you develop more severe signs. And this is the other arm of this, this information to patients, this partnership. What are the severe signs? When should I worry? What are the symptoms that are most dangerous? And when should I be feeling better or worse? And What's really important in in line with those green kind of milder symptoms is also thinking about what the severe symptoms are. And although we know breathlessness, severe myalgia, severe fatigue, chills, rigors are quite significant predictors of those with COVID who end up either dead or in intensive care or needing an admission, um, it is important the general public are also aware of those symptoms as being the kind of red flag symptoms. And also that... The onset of silent hypoxia is usually at days five to seven. And you're, if you're going to develop significant breathlessness, 95% of the time it's between days seven and 11. And again, that's really important in heightening the public's awareness of when the danger zones are, both in terms of symptoms and also the timing. And if they're lucky enough to have an oximeter, what those significant oxygen levels are. And also the warning that if you do note an incredible rapid onset of breathlessness, that's a time to get worry. If you can't speak in short sentences without getting breathless, and if you describe breathlessness at rest, that's a really important consternation of symptoms. So safety netting guidance is really important. And we produce this in England, but you're very welcome to have it and translate it if, if it's of use. Um, and I'll, you can share all the links afterwards in terms of what we've done. So across England, this was a project that was really born from clinical care. Patients and clinicians saw the value of of educating the public and um, empowering them with pulse oximeters right from the start. And um, it was an easy sell to the medical profession and the nursing profession in England as a result. Um, It was a harder sell, actually, to get government to back it initially because the evidence was slow to come and is still slow to come, as, as you can imagine. It makes common sense from a clinical perspective, because why should you not monitor patients? And it makes common sense from a, a patient perspective, because they want to know what the bad signs are to look out for. And um, what we found was that a key elements in terms of that national distribution were around the engagement, not just socially and politically, but also religious groups, as well as medical leadership. And then to develop a strategy of how we would fund and support regions attempting to implement this strategy with regional webinars, learning events, um, e-forums and and discussion forums and resources um, that that contain guidance, pathways, training materials that were shared widely and free of charge to ensure that everyone had access to a common vision and, and all of the materials required to implement it, with the ask in the future that we would collect the data and prove that this made a difference, and more of that later. So the, these learning resources are on websites, and again, all these links are available, that teach um, healthcare professionals how to monitor patients with COVID at home, um, and indeed the guidelines and pathways that we utilised and that we, we got to through a, a um, errors in the beginning, to be honest. We made errors and we learned from our mistakes um, to get to the point where things are are improving in terms of how we monitor and and measure and and manage patients with COVID in the home environment. And then toolkits for how do you step up and start a service from scratch within an hour? And how can you do this really quickly where the need arises? Um, And an ongoing learning network that still meets today and has hundreds of members up and down the country. And that, that's a really powerful element in terms of that collaboration and the family that is um, healthcare, trying to provide the, uh, its very best for, for patients everywhere. And this implementation across the small country of England occurred in, in, in quite rapid progression. So it was built around the early identification and protecting patients and protecting the healthcare system. 
And we started off at about a third of the country in December last year, moving quickly to 60%. And then by February, 100% of the whole country doing it. Um, we divided the country up into populations of around 10 million in, in, each, in each sort of cell for improvement as a region to try and base um, a, a, a unified strategy around. And, and that seemed to work for us. It's difficult to do an entire national strategy immediately just from your capital. It is more sensible to think about regions. Um, and um, what, what I guess the key element for, from a simple perspective for the general public and also for, for religious leaders or cultural or social leaders in, in, in parts of rural parts of the country and spread all over was around those tenets of look out for symptoms how variable this model could be based on your resource. But at the end of the day, it was about spotting that early deterioration. And if a patient came into hospital, ensuring that once stability was reached and recovery was reached, discharge was expedited in order to clear the healthcare system as soon as possible and get ready for the next patient, essentially. And, um, you know, the model was, was um, warmly liked in, from a hospital perspective. Again, we tried to simplify things as much as possible down to those 92% or less oxygen saturations. And then thinking about um, discharge upon recovery, really. And um, it, 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 it resonated with clinicians because it was simple. We also used um, walking tests of actually getting people to exert themselves over a 40 step walk distance or getting them to sit up and stand up uh, repeatedly over a minute to actually examine for evidence of uh, desaturation on exertion. So much like pneumocystis crinii pneumonia from all those years ago with HIV, um, COVID is a condition that causes this desaturation. And um, again, it was something that we had to rewrite the textbooks around and, and make clinicians aware of this, uh, again, in terms of looking out for severe signs. The discharge arm was also really important. So improving clinical trajectory was a gear to getting people out of hospitals early, even without super normal oxygen saturation levels. Because actually once patients are on a recovery phase, they're generally gonna do all right. And um, it's important to obviously clear the, clear the beds when we are overwhelmed with numbers of patients. Um, so um, we put in protocols in large parts of the country to think about early highlighting of potential discharges, early medical review to get patients out, and then with a view to getting people out under virtual care or what we called a virtual ward, where we were able to still intervene with hospital type treatments, including drugs like dexamethasone, um, without necessarily occupying a hospital bed. Um, and this is an important strategy going forward. Um, and early studies from around the world demonstrate that actually even treatment with, with oxygen at home via oxygen concentrators appears to be a safe thing to do in patients that you rapidly discharge with low oxygen levels who are on a recovery phase. So there is evidence growing in this area about the benefits as well as steroids, both at home and in the hospital. Um, the overall impact from a, a national perspective was a dramatic reduction in length of stay, which um, has been a really pivotal element in keeping our hospitals going and allowing us to restore function for things like elective surgery or other um, healthcare requirements in a hospital. And um, this reduction in length of stay and improved flow was accompanied by a reduction in mortality rates, about a third reduction. It wasn't just this virtual remote monitoring approach, but remote monitoring was a key element that led to this. Um, it was a safe model of care with an overall mortality rate for patients monitored in this um, non-hospital environment of less than 1%. Um, which is actually far better than we did with admitted hospital COVID patients during first peak. Um, and the impact uh, from a hospital perspective was that the green line here in the bottom right relates to COVID virtual care patients. The red line is hospital admissions. And what we found is we were able to rapidly reduce the numbers of admitted patients to beds and increase that virtual activity to keep our hospitals running, essentially. And that pattern has continued all around the country. Early evidence is also suggesting that by putting people on a home monitoring program such as this with oximetry or with symptom advice, um, you get a reduction in future hospital attendance from a COVID patient and hospital admission um, with quite a dramatic 30 to 38 percent reduction in the relative risk of a hospital admission. Again, this is really important thinking about how we are going to keep our hospitals from being overwhelmed should another pandemic occur. 
And um, this this concept of maintaining capacity is really important. And the concept of whether lower acuity admission areas would be necessary in the event of complete health system overall overwhelmingness and whether there was collapse and learning lessons from China and the Fangdang hospitals that were 13,000 spreaded size and what we might need to do should we become overwhelmed. So we had this in our back pocket for in my region because at the end of the day, we didn't know whether we were going to be able to cope with the vast numbers we saw during second peak and indeed what we may soon see within third peak. Um, so it was a question of keeping a really careful eye on whether non-hospital utilisation to admit those patients who are lower acuity earlier on for oxygen concentrators where necessary, potentially drugs like dexamethasone, but keep them out of your intensive care hospitals and save those intensive care hospitals for those that were really sick. And it's another strategy, I guess, if, if we get to a point where we become completely overwhelmed with another pandemic. Um, so in summary, this, this has now been recommended as a strategy within, by the WHO as a conditional um, uh, recommendation. And the, the, the principles are really simple. It's about flow through the emergency care system. It's about trust with patients in their own home environments. Simplicity of advice for patients about what they should and shouldn't look out for and when they should or shouldn't seek help. Protecting patients and protecting the healthcare system to ensure that it can still function in the face of a pandemic. And there are amazing examples around the world. And um, one is step one in India, which currently looks after 400,000 COVID patients at home remotely and is a great example. And I'm very happy to be sure to have a conversation with you. They have 85,000 new COVID cases a day and have done remarkably in the face of a, an incredible COVID pandemic, as I'm sure you're aware. So thank you so much for inviting us to talk today. And we'd be very happy to answer any questions.